choosing to listen to me. Um, so yeah, today I'll be giving a talk entitled Server Farm to Table or How the Internet Works. And I'll be doing this with the help of some cartoonish friends uh, right there. Uh, but before I really begin, uh, can I get a round of applause for the wonderful organizers of this lovely conference? As Jesse mentioned, uh, I came a really long way. I'm here from Brooklyn, uh, and this is my first time in, in Oklahoma, and y'all have made me feel so, so welcome. Uh, so it's been super great, and I'm really excited to give this talk. Uh, so again, my name is Jenna Zygen, and I'm an engineering manager at DigitalOcean. Uh, you might also know me as Zygenvector on Twitter. All right, so let's begin this journey from server farm to table. So uh, what this talk is going to endeavor to do is answer the age-old question of what happens when you type www.google.com into your browser and hit enter. So there's a cool model for answering questions such as this. Uh, it, it's called the OSI model, and it has seven layers. And the OSI model goes from layer one, which is the like physical bits in your computer, all the way up through layer seven, which is the full application layer. Uh, and so the full application layer in this case will be your browser. This talk is only going to start at level four, uh, which is the transport layer. We won't be talking about anything lower than that, so uh, nothing really about networking, though I'm sure there's plenty of stuff on the internet if you want to learn more about those lower layers. So um, what we will be talking about uh, are these things. So. Uh, go through all of these and also talk about optimizations that you can do along the way and also explain uh, with the help of all this information about um, like why those optimizations are really important. Uh, so we'll talk about IP address lookup, so that's that DNS thing that you might have heard of, <laughs> opening a socket, so TCP, which you might have just heard a little bit about. Uh, <laughs> So security stuff, so this is a TLS, uh, uh, SSL uh, bit in the past. Uh, then we'll get to the good stuff, so the HTTP request, what the server does with that HTTP request, um, then the HTTP response that comes from the server, and then the browser's parsing and rendering of the page. All right, so let's embark on this journey. So the first step is that your computer needs to map human readable, the human readable URL, www.google.com, it needs to be mapped to the address of a computer to talk to. Um, so the first thing your computer is going to do uh, is see uh, if it has recently obtained this information and it's going to check its cache. Um, so your browser might cache the IP address that it receives um, along the rest of this process that I'll explain. It might uh, store it for a pretty short amount of time that is uh, browser dependent. So there's a special flag in your browser that will say how long it's gonna cache these things. Uh, so if it's not in the cache, then the browser is going to call the get host by name library function. And the contents of this function kind of vary by operating system. Uh, but it's this function that's going to do the lookup. Uh, get host by name is going to first check if the host name can be resolved by reference in uh, your computer's uh, local hosts file. And the location of this file is going to vary uh, between your operating systems as well. I happen to know, because I'm a Mac user, that this file is at slash etc slash hosts. And it's this file that contains the information so your computer can know what local host is going to resolve to. So if, you, um, if you're on a Mac, you can just do cat slash etc slash hosts, and you'll see the contents of that file, and it should contain the local host <laughs> information. Um, so if get host by name uh, doesn't have the IP address already cached um, and it's not already in the, in the local hosts file, then it's going to make a request to the DNS server that's configured by the network stack. So this is typically going to be your ISP's uh, caching DNS server, but it could also be another DNS server that you uh, configured your computer to use. So another popular one is Google's uh, DNS server, which is at 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. 
So the browser is going to send the request off to get the IP address that corresponds to www.google.com. So this request is going to first go through the local router, which also has uh, a cache for this stuff. So it's going to check to see if it's in the cache, and then um, it might have it in the cache, and then you're good to go. You don't have to continue doing the rest of this process. For the take sake of this talk, we're going to pretend that you've never, ever been to www.google.com before, because then this talk would be a little boring and also kind of short. Uh, so um, it's pretty likely that at the router level, you will have already found had a cache hit for it. Uh, especially because uh, if you're using a router with a lot, a lot of people are using, it's pretty likely that like, a popular site will be cached, at least at this point. Um, but in the event that your router does not have this cached, um, the browser is going to end up hitting uh, the specified DNS server, uh, which is probably going to be your local ISP, and it's going to do this uh, via the UDP. Um, so UD UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol, and uh, UDP is kind of the very like basic network thing. Uh, it's great for unidirectional transactions. Um, because its delivery isn't really guaranteed in any order or really super guaranteed at all. It's really um, like up to the whims of the integrity of your network whether or not these packets are going to end up going through. So it's kind of like if you uh, were to like take a lot of, of balls and throw them at someone and they might not necessarily catch them, like that's, that's a pretty good UDP metaphor. Um, and because um, UDP is kind of uh, ha can only transmit a small amount of information, if this DNS request, uh, if this request to get the IP address is too uh, large, it's going to use TCP, which we'll talk about soon. So first, the DNS server is going to check its cache. Caching is going to come up a lot in this talk. Uh, so the DNS server is going to check and see if it's recently uh, looked this up. Uh, if not, then the DNS server is going to go uh, ask some other servers for um, f to get the IP address for www.google.com. And this is a recursive process. So uh, as I'll uh, explain, this could potentially take a bit of time. Uh, and then the client just has to wait for the answer. So the way this goes is that uh, the DNS server is going to uh, connect to the root name server and it's going to say, hey, do you know where www.google.com is? Then the root name server is probably going to be like, no, I don't really know, but you should probably go ask .com. And then the uh, DNS server is then going to go to .com and say, hey, do you know where www.google.com is? And then that .com is probably going to say, no, I don't really know, but you should probably go ask Google.com. And then the DNS server is going to go to Google.com's name server and say, hey, do you know where www.google.com is? And um, in this case, Google.com knows where www.google.com is, and it's going to uh, respond to the DNS server with this IP address. It's um, also going to send um, a TTL with it, or a time to live. So this is going to tell the DNS server how long to cache this, uh, the IP address so we don't have to go through the whole recursive process again. Uh, so uh, you know, TTL, it's a good thing to have because it's going to make this process a lot more performant. So the longer the TTL is, the more performant it's going to be. But it's also going to be very hard to change things. The like TTL the standardly used to be about 24 hours, which is why it takes like DNS a bit of time to propagate through everything. Um, so um, once the DNS server gets the answer from the uh, authoritative name server, it's going to then uh, send it back to your computer that asked for the IP address to begin with, and then. Uh, can go on its merry way. Uh, if you want to check this out in your terminal, you can use the dig command. So uh, here I did dig www.google.com, and then you can see uh, the response and just check out what goes on there. So now that you have the IP address, uh, you can then start to open a socket with the web server. So what's going to happen is your computer is going to take that IP address and the given port number from the URL. Uh, for HTTP, this port number is going to default to port 80, which is why you often don't see port numbers on the ends of URLs. Mm -hmm. uh, and for HTTPS, it's going to default to port uh, 443. 
Uh, so it's going to take the IP address and the port number and then make a call to the system library function that is uh, called socket, and that's going to request a TCP socket stream. So TCP uh, stands for Transmission Control Protocol, and this uh, is kind of a level up from UDP. Uh, TCP is going to deliver a reliable, ordered, and error-checked stream of packets across the network. And TCP is the protocol that underlies HTTP and TLS, which we'll be talking about, uh, as well as FTP, email, and SSH. So uh, the client is going to establish this TCP connection with the server, and it's going to go something like this. The computer is going to say, hey, web server, will you talk to me? The web server is going to say something like, sure, and then uh, your computer is going to be like, cool, thanks for letting me talk to you. Uh, what this actually looks more like is uh, your computer is going to send, or the like connecting computer is going to send a SYN packet with a randomly selected sequence number of X. Um, then your, the computer it's connecting to is going to reply with a SYNAC uh, message. It's going to have an acknowledgement number that is set to X, that uh, previously random number. It's going to set it to X plus 1. And then uh, the server is going to choose another random sequence number Y. And then the final step is that the client is going to respond with an ACK message, which has its sequence number set to the received acknowledgement number, which was X plus 1, and then its acknowledgement number set to Y plus 1. Yeah. So a bit complicated, but kind of like the basis of the internet. So um, uh, with TCP, especially with, with web connections, more than one connection is going to be opened and saved for later, because it's pretty likely that the, uh, the document might need to request more things. So uh, also with TCP, there's congestion control, which is kind of a relic of the past when networks weren't quite so reliable or quite so strong. So what's going to happen is the requests are going to start small and then ramp up in size to make sure the network can support the requests. So your computer might send a little bit of information to the web server, and the web server is going to be like, yeah, I got it. And then it'll send a little bit more information, and then the server will be like, yeah, I got that too. And then your computer might send a bit more, and then the web server will be like, whoa, I didn't get all those. Slow down. Uh, so the, uh, it's listening for packet, uh, packet loss. And this is also where a bunch of the latency comes from in the whole um, server farm to table process. Um, and this latency is constrained by the speed of light. So uh, you might have heard that like, the distance between computers affects how long this is going to take. That's because you're constrained by the speed of light. So that's also uh, the motivating factor behind the optimization of choosing data centers that are close to your users to serve them their information. If you want to check out uh, TCP, you can use uh, TCP dump in your terminal. You might have to use sudo for it. Um, and you can see uh, like all of the, the pretty much all the network traffic behind it. You can also use Wireshark uh, if you're more into uh, GUI type programs. So um, in this case, I, I wanted to do a kind of organic version of getting www.google.com, and it only showed me UDP packets. I imagine there's just some like caching stuff going on. Um, but yeah, I just captured three TCP, uh, three packets, which is a uh, dash C3 flag. It will accept a bunch of flags. Um, so check it out if you're interested. So after the socket has been established, uh, you might be uh, needing to do some security stuff. So if you're using HTTPS, uh, you're going to need to establish a secure connection uh, through, um, at this point, we're using TLS, which is Transport Layer Security. Its predecessor was SSL, uh, Secure Socket Layer, if uh, that's something you're familiar with. So the client computer is going to uh, in brief, send a client hello message to the server with its TLS version, a list of cipher algorithms, uh, and the compression methods that it has available. Then the server is going to reply with a server hello message to the client, uh, reciprocating that information, so sending back its TLS version, selected cipher, selected compression methods, as well as the server's public certificate. The server, uh, then the certificate's going to contain a public key that will be used by the client to encrypt the rest of the handshake <laughs> until the client and the server can agree on a symmetric key. Uh, then the client will uh, verify the server certificate, and then they'll do some more cryptography stuff, send secret messages encrypted back and forth to each other. Um, uh, and then uh, finally, 
then uh, the client, well, almost finally, the client's going to send a finished message to the server uh, encrypting a hash of all the, of the transmission up to this point with the agreed upon symmetric key. And then last but not least, the server is going to generate its own hash, decrypt the client's, the, the hash sent by the client uh, to verify that they match. If it does, send its own finished mes message, uh, also encrypted with the symmetric key. A little lengthy, but security is important. So that's cool. Um, so once you're all uh, connected and secure, we can move on to um, HTTP, which is going to uh, help us get our Google.com into our browser. So HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Uh, and unless the client and the server are going to negotiate using uh, a more uh, recently spec'd out version of HTTP, so uh, speedy or um, it's uh, evolved form HTTP2, so unless you negotiate using something uh, like a, a level up, then you're going to be using HTTP 1.1, which is kind of what we're, we've all been used to uh, for the most part. Uh, and HTTP is uh, stateless. It uses a request response model, and it is also a plain text protocol. Uh, so the client, to start this off, is going to end up sending a request like this. Uh, so it's going to contain a request with a bunch of headers and then a single blank new line to the server <laughs> indicating that the content of the request is all done. Then the server is going to receive this and then process the request by using an HTTP daemon. Uh, so that's going to handle the requests and the responses on the server side. So um, examples of HTTP daemons are uh, Apache or Nginx. You might have heard of those. Uh, so then I'm going to gloss over a bunch of server stuff because I'm more of a front-end kid. But the server might do some uh, load balancing and some database stuff, um, routing, fun time. Um, and then the server is going to break down the request into uh, the following parameters. So it's going to uh, take from the request the HTTP request method. So it's either going to be uh, get, post, head, put, delete options. In this case, because we use the URL bar to enter a URL uh, and then hit enter, it's going to be a get request. The, it's also going to, the server is also going to get the domain out of the request, which in this case is google.com. And it's also going to get the requested path or page, which in this case is slash because no uh, path was really requested. And slash is the default path, uh, just like in the Unix uh, file system structure. Um, if you're lucky, the server might send you back a three or four not modified response. So if you've been to this site before and the HTTP headers that the client sent to the server um, included enough information for the server to know that the version that the server, that the client has cached is the same as the, the version that's still on the server. Uh, so if there's enough information to determine that they're the same thing, then the server will send back a three or four not modified. Um, and a request that kind of looks like this. And this is very helpful because then you don't have to go through a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about in, in the future. Um, so yeah, this is a lot less work, but it's the result of some work that you have to do on the engineering side to get this to work. It might, it's not going to happen immediately out of the box. So one thing that you can do uh, to make this happen uh, is use uh, e-tags in your header. So an e-tag is just a, a unique identifier for a version of a file. So the first time you request uh, something from the server, um, and if you have it configured properly uh, with the response, it'll send back an e-tag. Uh, in the header, and then the client's going to cache this for a while with the e-tag. And then when the client asks for the, the, um, the resource again, it'll send the e-tag header back with it so the server can check to see if they're the same. So if they're the same, you'll get that 304 not modified. But if it's not, you'll end up getting the whole uh, request, including all of the, the response payload, back again. So um, in the case that... Um, you don't have something, uh, the current version of the file cached. Um, you know, and if the request from the server and the, the server did everything that was, if the request was valid and successful and the server did everything properly, um, the server will respond with something that looks kind of like this. So it'll have a uh, 200 OK status code 
some other headers, a single blank new line, and then the payload, which in this case is the uh, HTML content. If things don't go so well, such as you tried to uh, access a resource that wasn't there, or if the server did something wrong, you might get an error code. You also might get a redirect, which is the 300 class of errors. Um, um, if it's a client error, you'll get something which is the like 400 class of errors, so you might get like 404 not found or 403 forbidden. Uh, and if the server is the thing that messed up, you'll get uh, 500 <coughs> class of errors. Um, so check out the HTTP uh, response. This is kind of for effect. Uh, you can use curl. Um, so in this case, I, I curled www.google.com and just got the entire body of of www.google.com, which for how simple that page is, contains a lot of stuff. Um, so uh, you can use, again, you can use curl to do this. Um, so yeah, that was a pretty big response. So, um, and the size of, of the response um, corresponds to how long it's uh, gonna take to finish the request response lifecycle. Uh, so a good way to get your page downloading super fast is to use a compression method. And gzip is the most popular uh, method of compression. And um, so what gzip does is it's going to find uh, repeated substrings throughout your file and then replace those substrings with a reference to a substring somewhere else. And this is super great for HTML because there's a limited amount of tags you can have in your HTML and they're probably gonna be repeated throughout the document. Like imagine how many divs there are in www.google.com, so all the, the string, the div string, is just gonna be replaced with a reference. Um, so in fact, gzipping generally reduces the response size by about 70%, uh, and if you're worried that, like, well, what if I send something that's compressed and my user doesn't have something that can support gzip. Uh, about 90% of today's internet traffic travels through browsers that at least claim to support gzip. And um, in, the, in the like request response negotiation, you'll probably figure out if uh, your user doesn't in fact support gzip. So as soon as the browser starts receiving bytes, it's going to start parsing the file. Uh, usually starts, uh, usually happens in 8K chunks that are, yeah, 8K chunks. Um, so it's gonna download it in bits and pieces and immediately start um, pushing those bytes into the HTML parser. Um, but before the formal parsing for rendering, the bytes are gonna get passed through a speculative parser or a look ahead pre-parser um, that's going to look ahead for external resources like JavaScript, CSS, and images. So it can start getting them from the server immediately. So if it finds these things within the HTML document, it'll use the extra TCP request that we had open from before, those like pre-warmed uh, TCP requests, um, if they're from the same host. If you're requesting something from a different host, then the client has to do the whole DNS dance over again, um, which is gonna take some time. So the speculative parser wasn't always part of um, of browsers, uh, so when it was put into some browsers, it improved page load performance by 20%, which is a lot. Uh, so that's pretty neat. So um, as the speculative parsing is going on, the bytes are going to be fed into the primary HTML parser. And the parsing algorithm is described in detail by the HTML5 specification, or the HTML5 spec. So what's gonna happen is the browser is going to uh, read the raw bytes of the HTML um, off of disk or off of the network and translate them into individual characters based on the specified encoding that you should have at the top of the HTML uh, document. So this might be like UTF-8 or something. And then these characters are going to get uh, broken up into tags, which is the tokenization process. Um, and then those tokens are going to get made into uh, DOM nodes, which are then arranged into the DOM tree. And DOM stands for a document object model. So you're gonna end up at the end of this parsing process uh, with the DOM tree made from the HTML document, and it's going to have an almost one-to-one -one relationship to the markup, um, at, because it went through the parser going from the byte stream all the way through to this, uh, this DOM tree. Um, but uh, the HTML parser is kind of unique. Uh, HTML can't be parsed by um, like usual parsing methods because um, it's not context-free. 
And this is because um, the HTML is a very forgiving language. The parser is very forgiving. And in fact, the spec requires that the parser be 100% fault tolerant. So it's never going to error. It'll at least render something. It might not render what you wanted it to render, but it will, will, it'll render a thing. Um, kind of hopefully close to what you wanted, if not exactly what you wanted. Um, so because of this, uh, because it's specified never to error, a lot of the parser code is about fixing each HTML's author, HTML author's mistakes. Because we're humans, we make mistakes, but the parser's got you. Uh, so the parser uh, needs to correct things like invalid tags, unclosed tags, incorrect nesting. Um, and so to en endeavor not to error, um, Browsers create custom parsers that are like a million lines of C++, and a big chunk of this browser code is dedicated to uh, creating this fault-tolerant parser that contains all of this like code for targeting specific uh, human errors. So, um, <clears throat> sorry, while the um, things being while well, the document is being parsed, the client is going to request, parse, and execute all inlined assets. Uh, so these are the images, scripts, style sheets, favicons, whatever you've referenced in your document, or even uh, things that are inlined within these tags. So um, browsers have imposed limits on how many parallel downloads you can have from the same domain. So it used to be two, so you could only download two things at the same time from the same domain. But now browsers, uh, the last time I checked, you can download anywhere from six in some browsers all the way up to 13 parallel things from the same domain um, at the same time. Um, so this is often a bottleneck for getting all of the, the resources you need to fully load your page. And a way to get around this is you could maybe serve your images from multiple host names um, so you can get around that same host name parallel download limit. Um, you could also combine all, your, all, your, all of your files together so you can concat concatenate your JavaScript, make CSS sprites, uh, or even inline your images as data URIs in your HTML file uh, or in your CSS file. Um, but the trade-off with this is uh, comes back with caching. So if you're going to change one little thing in one little, uh, for example, JavaScript file, uh, and then it all gets bundled together into a concatenated file, um, it's going to invalidate the cache that you might have, uh, the cache version that you might have of that bundle file. Uh, but I think it's generally agreed upon that this concatenation, the, the benefits of concatenation outweigh the uh, negatives of having more uh, frequent cache invalidations. Um, as I mentioned, a good thing to do uh, for these assets is to cache them. So instead of having to go and do the whole round trip to get these uh, files again, they're just right there on, on your computer, and uh, the browser will know that they're there, ready for you to, um, to use. And um, this caching is set by the headers that are uh, sent back with these assets. Um, and they'll include uh, headers about how long you're going to keep these things cached uh, so that the browser uh, knows when to invalidate them. Uh, and also another good thing to do is to gzip and uh, minify all your assets. So if you see, uh, like, your JavaScript files have been shrunk down a lot and they're pretty impossible to read as a human, um, that's good for your computer, though, and uh, well, this, it might make it hard to debug, but you can then also put in uh, such thing as, as source maps so that you can debug things uh, that have been minified. You can also uh, optimize your images to make them smaller. Uh, I know from, from experience that uh, SVGs that are exported from like Sketch or from Photoshop often have extra information that the browser doesn't really care about. So you can remove it if you run it through an optimizer. Uh, I've used SVGo with uh, great success. So this is um, all important because as the parser is going and it, it'll run into a JavaScript include, further parsing is going to stop because JavaScript has the ability to manipulate the DOM using document.write. So then any HTML that's then added by document.write has to then get fed back into the main parser. So because of this, the parsing of the document is going to stop until the script has been downloaded, uh, if it needs to be, uh, and then executed. So uh, even while the script is downloading, the 
browser won't start any other downloads, even if they are on different host names. So this also this is, um, also feeds back into why concatenating all your JavaScript together is important, so you don't have to have that extra uh, fetching uh, latency. But it also explains why it's good to put your scripts at the bottom of the page, right before the closing body tag, uh, so that when your browser is going to block on um, maybe downloading and then parsing this JavaScript, all the good things have already happened. You might already have something rendered to your page. Uh, so a way to get around this blocking thing, um, there are a few. One is that you can add a defer attribute to your script so it won't halt the document parsing and then the document will just be executed after the entire document is parsed. Another more recent addition to the HTML5 spec is that you can uh, mark the script as asynchronous using the async attribute so it will be parsed and executed by a different thread in parallel. Uh, and this is kind of like a contract that you won't call document.write or else it's okay to have it just be thrown away so it doesn't mess up parsing. Um, so in addition to JavaScript files, you also need to um, maybe download and definitely parse CSS files. So it might seem that like DOM, uh, CSS doesn't change the DOM tree, so there's no reason to wait uh, for the CSS files to be downloaded and parsed. Um, there's no reason to wait for them and stop document parsing. But um, the issue isn't between a, uh, like a relationship between the CSS and the DOM. It's a better relationship uh, between the JavaScript files and the CSS files. So uh, often, more often than you'd think, scripts are going to be asking for style information during this document parsing phase. So if the styles aren't loaded and parsed yet, the script might get the wrong answer, uh, and this has uh, caused some problems. So like, you think about some jQuery files you might have written that just ask for the height or uh, width of a thing. Uh, that script is going to need to know uh, and have loaded all of the CSS information to get the right answer. Um, so different browsers have different ways of dealing with this CSS JavaScript interaction. So Firefox is going to block all scripts when there's a style sheet that still needs to be downloaded and parsed. WebKit's a little more lenient and it's going to block scripts only when they try to access certain style properties that might be affected by the CSS. So um, CSS also needs to be parsed as I mentioned um, and um, so the CSS is going to be parsed into a um, CSS object model. So the, um, the CSS parser is a lot uh, less complicated than the HTML parser because it's context free, but it goes through uh, very similar steps to the HTML parser, uh, all the way going from the byte stream all the way to the CSS. Uh, so uh, having this be a tree makes sense because of the uh, recursive nature of, of the application of these styles, the cascade. So uh, this, this tree is only going to include overrides to the browser's default style sheet. It's not also going to include the styles that uh, are included with your browser. Um, so after the CSS is all parsed, then the JavaScript can definitely keep going, and then once that JavaScript file is done, then you can start um, loading and parsing the subsequent JavaScript file. So uh, when that's all done, then you can keep parsing your HTML. Uh, but we're not quite done yet because the browser needs to know a little bit more information in order to uh, be able to render the page. So the uh, CSS tree and the DOM trees are going to be combined into a render tree. Uh, and this render tree is then used to compute the layout of each visible element and is going to serve as an input to the paint process, uh, which then renders the pixels to the screen. So uh, because of this, because you need both the DOM tree and the CSS tree uh, to be merged together to form the render tree, uh, HTML and CSS are render blocking resources. So the browser is going to hold off all rendering until it's processed all the HTML and all of the CSS and the DOM and CSS um, trees are constructed. So this is one good reason to keep your style sheets at the top of the page. So putting the style sheets near the bottom of the page is going to prohibit uh, progressive rendering in many browsers. Uh, so these browsers are going to block rendering to avoid having to redraw elements later. Also from a uh, UX perspective, you might get that dreaded flash of unstyled content. Um, 
And that's, that's no good, because you want to show off the pretty page that you just made. And if that's not enough, the HTML spec clearly states that style sheets are supposed to go in the head tag. So there's three good reasons to keep your CSS at the top of the page. So elements in the render tree, the purple tree, are uh, they're going to correspond to elements in the DOM tree, but it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correspondence. The render tree is only going to include things that are to be rendered. So it's not going to include non-visual DOM elements uh, like the head tag or script tags, and it's um, going to compute what things are visible and what things aren't. So using like if something is display none, it won't include that in the render tree. Uh, Things that are visibility hidden, though, will be uh, because it's going to leave the space uh, in the flow and it's rendering, although there might not be any explicit pixels that represent that element um, once it gets painted. Uh, so the render tree is going to contain information about what nodes are visible and the computed styles, but we haven't yet figured out where these things are going to go or how big they're supposed to be. And this process of figuring out the geometry of elements is called layout or reflow. Layout is a recursive process. It starts at the root renderer, uh, which corresponds to the HTML tag, uh, the HTML element in the, H in the HTML document, and then it's going to continue uh, computing all the geometric information for each renderer that requires it. So all of these renderers, so all of these blocks in the render, uh, in the render tree, have a layout or a reflow method, and then each renderer is going to invoke the layout of its children, uh, and then re uh, if if it has children that need to be relayed out. So in order to not do a full layout for every small change, the browsers um, will flag certain renderers as, as dirty. So if a renderer needs to be changed, it gets a dirty flag, or it might also get a its children are dirty flag. Um, so because of this, layout can either be a global process, you can relay out, lay out the whole page, or incremental, it'll only relay out the things that have been marked dirty. And, uh, the incremental layouts are done in async batches based on a timer in the browser. So um, once we know the location and dimensions of these elements, we can start then representing everything as pixels on the page, which is the painting process. So very similar to the rendering process, um, painting is going to, uh, it's a recursive process. So the render tree will be traversed and each renderer's paint method will be called to display the content. Uh, and also like the layout process, painting can be either global or incremental. Uh, and this is how you get that region specific repainting that we all endeavor for. So once the HTML document is fully downloaded and parsed, the page is marked as interactive and the DOM content uh, loaded event is fired. Um, and this happens uh, even if you're still waiting for style sheets, images, and subframes to finish loading. At this point, you can click around the page because it's interactive. At this point, the uh, scripts marked as deferred are then downloaded. And then once every, everything has been downloaded and parsed, the document is marked as complete and the load event is fired. Um, I would mentioned HTTP2, so I'm just going to gloss over it a little bit. Uh, HTTP2 is a, a new version of the HTTP spec um, that browsers are currently working to implement. Uh, it grew out of the work with Speedy, which was Google's uh, attempt to improve HTTP, uh, but HTTP2 is now a more uh, global spec. Uh, HTTP includes such great things as uh, header compression, so you're not going to have to send repeated headers back and forth. It'll just um, say like, hey, just remember those headers from before. There's also server push technologies, so it's going to send the HTML, uh, send assets with the HTML because it knows you're going to need them eventually. And then it'll also load page elements in parallel over a single HTTP connection instead of having to open uh, multiple ones and have to do that uh, synchronously. All right, so um, that's a small slice of the entire process of what happens when you type www.google.com into your browser. Um, so if you wanted to learn uh, anything more about anything more in depth, these are the things I read to put this uh, presentation together. Um, they're each very good. I especially will vouch for the Wikipedia articles. Um, and also, 
the complete list of all of the songs I butchered to help teach you about the internet. Um, <laughs> so if you're interested in, uh, in, these, in seeing these slides, uh, they're up on my website at jenna.is slash thunderplanes. Um, and uh, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you learned a lot.